Um, but where we left off last week in the basic just theology of suffering, where when I was thinking about scripture and examples in scripture of suffering, I thought of basically three general types of suffering or three sufferers that we find in scripture. Um, the first one that we're going to talk about briefly are those who suffer as a result of their own sinful choices. Now, can you think just off the top of your head about some examples from scripture of those who suffered because of sinful choices that they made? His sin with Bathsheba and then the loss of his baby. Yeah. Absolutely, Thera. <laughs> we can, yes, we can look to them as when suffering started at the, with the fall and the curse. Jonah. Jonah? I don't have him down, yeah. Samson. I do have Samson down, yeah. Good. Um, I thought of Sarah with Hagar, the whole thing of jumping ahead of God, and, and then some of the, the tumultuous <laughs> part of her life that resulted in her impatience. Um, so when we, as we look at some of these examples, let's just be honest, is this, is this you or is this me? Is part of what we're suffering right now or has maybe have been suffering, can we, can we look at it and say, yes, you know, if I were to do some soul searching, some of what I am suffering has been, um, I've had a, a hand in, in this. And then when we look at it, sometimes we, we look back and say, yes, I have had a hand in it, but we, we're staying stuck in our suffering. We're staying stuck with our guilt and our shame maybe about what we have done in our past um, rather than moving on. Physically, think of it like this. It'd be like me bemoaning the effects of my diabetes and how awful I feel while I'm sitting there putting down a pack of Oreos, okay? Yeah. <laughs> or, or talking about how, how tired I am all the time while I over, overload on carbs and don't get outside at all. Oh, sweetie. She's suffering. Oh. He. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But similarly, let's think about it this way. Sometimes we feel maybe confused or depressed or discouraged, and yet we don't open the Word of God. We haven't opened the Word of God and let it speak to us. Or we feel, um, we wonder why we have no power over the sins and addictions in our life, and yet we never pray. We're prayerless. We forsake the assembling of ourselves together, either partially or wholly, and we, we wonder why we feel so disconnected from our church family or from others um, and how friendless we are. So, you know, we, or we could refuse the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the counsel of godly people and find ourselves in a relationship that is harmful and destructive and, um, you know, wonder... Or, you know, that's how we got there. We, we didn't tune in with the Holy Spirit. We weren't listening to, to counsel. Anyway, the way of the transgressor is hard, and we all know this. And many of us, my, I can tell you, I've experienced this firsthand. So what do we learn from this? This isn't supposed to be discouraging. What do we learn from these examples? What's one thing we, you could say we learn from it? God is very forgiving. Oh, Amen. Amen. Patience. Okay. I've been suffering. Well, I'm going to change that. I've been blessed to be have, have to be a type two diabetic since I was 38 years old. Mm -hmm. It has taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that it taught me was you don't know what you're able to do until you have to go through it. I used to be one of these people. Oh, I can never get my blood sugar. Mm -hmm. I can never test my blood sugar. Well, I'm testing my blood sugar and I'm giving. Yeah. So you never know when you're able to do Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyone else? Emma? Um, it makes me think of, because some often times we, when we think about suffering, we think of Joseph and Job, and like, you know, right. they don't have any sin that points to their suffering, but, mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes it's trials that are, are like our suffering, mm -hmm. and um, I think of James 1 when it talks about like the purpose of trials and like it's to work patience like you were saying but then also to let patience have our perfect work so we can be perfect and like just the idea of like God bringing us to completeness yeah. through our difficulties. And 
that's going to be our number two one category that we talk about. <laughs> no, that's good. That's that's absolutely right. Sarah, yes. Before you went to yes. I was thinking on the on the front end mm -hmm. of using of looking at people as examples yeah. of what not to do so we don't put ourselves into a place where we're suffering the consequences of our sin. Yes. And going like that's not wise. Yeah. Well, doesn't scripture say that these things were given us for as an example so that we don't fall into these same sins and traps? And Right. Excellent. So I think it's good. It, it teaches us to take sin seriously. It helps us to learn from their examples um, and that there are consequences from, there are natural consequences from our sin. The Bible says we do reap what we sow in Galatians 6, 5. And it does say that our Father disciplines those that he loves um, in Hebrews 12, 6. So if you want to write these verses down, we may not look every one of them up. But some of these natural consequences can be very hard in, and can be long-lasting, depending on the sin. But what you said, friends, God is merciful. God is forgiving. He forgives all of our sins when we mourn and confess and turn from them. And, you know, an example of David, when he did suffer the death of his baby son as a result of his sin with Bathsheba, um, he didn't let sin defeat him and keep him from going on. After that, he wrote Psalm 51 for us. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore to me the joy of my salvation. And he also wrote after, after that, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So thank the Lord for David. Um, thank the Lord for Paul. <laughs> Paul tells us in Romans 5, 20 to 21, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And if he had a lot of sin in his past, um, yeah, <laughs> if anyone did, he did, right? And so once we've gotten things right with the Lord, we can and should just confidently move forward and not stay stuck. Guilt and shame don't serve any more purpose in our lives at that point. We learn, we grow, we know that he can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. I came across that verse in Joel 2, 25 through 27, a a pastor friend of ours who had had a very rough life, he, he used to claim those verses. Um, I'm not sure this is 100% right hermeneutics, but I think that that pretty much really describes what the Lord can do if he did it for his people Israel, that he can do it for us too, that he, he delights in making beauty out of ashes, right? That's in Isaiah 61.3. And he, he delights in fresh starts. So um, absolutely have hope as we look to the examples. I'm sure Paul at times saw the faces of those that he had drug into prison and who, the men, women, and children that he had killed. Do you think he never struggled with that? I believe he, he did, but it was Paul who said, I have learned to put those things of the past behind and to press toward the mark of his high calling. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Um, the Lord allowed him to be the tool to bring countless men and women and children to Christ once he submitted to him and, and, and got his life on track with, with, when the Lord pulled him out of his sin and forgave him, I should say. So I thank the Lord for his example. So just for a minute, you know, if I, I would say let's just have a minute of prayer in, introspective prayer, not out loud, where we all just ask the Lord to search us and see if there be any sin in our hearts, any attitude, any lacking spiritual disciplines in our life that are contributing to our present suffering or pain. And just take a minute, and as you pray and ask him to reveal that to you, also ask him to reveal if there's any place where you're holding on to any guilt or... Um, shame over past sins that he has freed you from um, and ask him to just uh, remind you that you are free indeed, that he has freed you from the past, that he wants you to move <coughs> on, press forward um, and, and do, you know, do what he has for you. So just take a minute and then we'll, we'll go on.
You know, sometimes even guilt over our past can lead us to discouragement, health issues, spiritual ineffectiveness, living in the past, not looking forward. So I just pray that if anyone who finds themselves there, that they would they would see his love and mercy and forgiveness today and just be determined to let him move you past, move forward. The second type of suffering we see in scripture, the type of sufferer, are those who are being sanctified through their suffering, like Emma was saying, where God's purpose is being worked out in their lives and the cause might be unknown. Um, and examples you gave, Emma, I think you said Job and Joseph, those were the two big ones that stuck out to me. Can you think of any other ones? I couldn't think of a ton for this, but I thought of um, a couple more. We didn't know why my grandfather... <clears throat> I mean, scripture examples. Oh, scripture yes, examples. scripture examples. No, that's okay. I didn't hear the scripture. That's okay. <laughs> Any from scripture. That's all right. Was it Job? Like Job? Yeah. Job. Job, Joseph. I was thinking of... Well, um, yes. Yes. We, well, we knew what... He knew what his purpose was. These had maybe limited understanding. I think of Naomi. We're never told that she actually sinned. Um, I, I always questioned why she would have left in, and settled in Moab, which was an ungodly place to bring your family. But, um, but we never know, knew why she suffered. And, but God worked through her and her daughter-in-law. And yeah, she became the great-great-grandmother of David and of Jesus down the line. And it's so neat, that story. The blind man who Jesus healed, people tried to point to things that he may have done, but... Jesus said no, it wasn't because of the sin of his parents, it wasn't because of his sin. But, do you remember why? So the glory of God? <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is often where we find ourselves, probably more often than not. Um, we, like Job, don't see the purpose or meaning for our suffering in the moment. We may feel like Joseph, like we've been forgotten and, and kind of left in the dark and, and we're confused. And questions just abound, and Job certainly had questions, didn't he? And our faith feels tested to its very limits in, in these times. Well, I, I was thinking about what these individuals shared in common, and I thought of two things. Um, the first thing was, like Jesus, they submitted to God in the darkest hour of their testing. Job, after losing his children, do you remember what he cries out? He cries out in Job 121, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you imagine worshiping in the darkest hour? And Job worshiped in his darkest hour. Um, and then again in Job 13 through 15, after his continual loss and pain, he says, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. I don't understand why he's putting me through these things. I don't, I see no answer. And his friends certainly gave him no, no answers, just more questions. He hurt, he questioned, but he trusted. And Joseph, too, held on to his faith. He submitted to God during the trial, during his many years of mistreatment and suffering. And I can imagine that his faith was stretched to its limits as well. So besides submitting to, to God in their darkest hour of testing, what else did they share in common? I would say that they came to a much deeper understanding of their God through their suffering. Their faith became stronger as they persevered, persevered. It wasn't easy, um, but they persevered in their trial. So, um, where am I? Here I am. They saw glimpses to varying degrees of his hands at work, but Job testifies in, um, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't see Always, He didn't understand. But in chapter 42, verse 5, we see his final testament is, My ears had heard of you, but now my heart, my eyes have seen you. And that was Job's testament after all of that. It was, I, I had heard of you. I, I had knowledge of you. I, I even loved you. I had faith in you. But my eyes have seen you in a whole different way. And um, Joseph's testimonial was to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as is this day to save many people alive. So J Joseph, too, testified, God 
had a purpose in this. I see it now. I see what he was doing. I didn't see it then. Um, and you know, not that we, we are not always given understanding in our trials. We're not promised that we will. Um, sometimes we try to read into our suffering, well, I think God is doing this because of this, or we try to do that for other people. We try, <laughs> like, I think she's going through this because she hasn't been in church for a while, you know, <laughs> or, or whatever. Um, we need to be careful that we don't become like the friends of Job because they completely misrepresented what God was doing in their, in their suffering friend's life. And they were brought into account uh, by God for that. So the promise that we all have through suffering is that there is a very wise and very loving God that is taking us through this process. And one verse I've read in my own devotions recently, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, a really wonderful verse. He is transforming us into his same image from glory to glory. And what does that mean? From one life-changing event to another, from one sanctifying event, event to another that is sometimes hard and sometimes painful and sometimes awful. He is taking us one step closer to being in his image, and he's doing this through the Spirit of the Lord. So that's a wonderful verse. So we can trust that God is doing a good work even when we can't see it. And isn't, isn't that faith after all? We use that word faith. And yet faith is trusting what we can't see, and it is believing when we can't understand. And when our faith goes outside of the bounds of what we can understand and see, then it's being tested, and then it's, it's real. And sometimes our struggles are showing us, hey, our faith wasn't as strong as I thought it was. It didn't take much to make me start doubting and questioning. And um, thank you for strengthening my faith through this trial, Lord. Yeah, absolutely. God is glorified. He is magnified through it. Yeah, that's right, Cheryl. And I know you can testify to that as well. I came across a quick video of why bad things happen to good people. It was really quick. Why does a loving father allow us to suffer? Does he really care? And it was a Christian that declares that God is good, is the one who's on trial, and he's being asked these questions by an attorney of the sufferer. And all eyes are just on him as this question gets asked because everyone knows this is the question that have that caused some people to not you know to turn away from God some people to walk away from God it's, it's a hard question and this man answered he says this is sim his simple answer when one has faith all things have purpose and he continues he said I asked the Lord for strength God gave me difficulties to make me make me strong I asked the Lord for wisdom God gave me problems to solve. I asked the Lord for courage. God gave me difficulties to overcome. I asked the Lord for love. God gave me troubled people to help. God answered my prayers. I was like, yeah. How many of you prayed for those things? I have. <laughs> so what's the lesson we take away not to pray for these things anymore? <laughs> no, but you know, let's just ask the Lord to submit to his hand like our Lord Jesus did as our example, and to trust him even when it hurts that he is working his plan in, in our lives. Um, any questions, any thoughts on that one? We'll move on to number three. A very specific kind of suffering, those who suffered specifically for the cause of Christ or for their faith. Can you throw out some examples on this? Yeah, scriptural examples. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't specify. John Stephen, John the Baptist. I didn't even get those. My my mind tended to go to Old Testament, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and and then I thought of um, obviously Paul, Peter, and all the apostles. Only one, only John wasn't wasn't martyred, but yet he suffered. <laughs> he suffered as well. <clears throat> but this is a specific form of suffering. Our suffering for Christ takes many different faces, doesn't it? Rarely do we fear death in postmodern America. But I bet our missionaries can testify differently. I would love to have her testify right now of, of what it's like in China. Um, and we take for granted that 
that our brothers and sisters around the world are not facing this. But as we deal with life in, in our world here, what are some of the faces that different kinds of persecution can take? What might it look like? When you're standing up against the cultural wars of today, yes. the abortion, yeah. the transgender, the gender identity, yeah. Yeah. You're going to be <clears throat> cursed. You're going to be talked to very nasty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a possibility that it's physical. There sure is. Yeah. So, yeah. it could be in a number of different and It doesn't matter, like, where you are. You could be in Walmart just having a conversation. Somebody could get irate. Yeah. You never know. Uh, yeah. From family. Yeah. Right. yeah. From family. Yeah. Family can distance themselves from you. Um, light. Darkness doesn't like light. They're not going to want to be around you. Your friends may distance themselves from you at times. Anything else come to your mind? I remember somebody telling you you were brainwashed, <laughs> that you had been brainwashed all your life, and that you were, you know, ig that were ignorant, closed-minded, that were judgy. We don't like being called those words, do we? Obviously, they they hurt sometimes, but. Um, you know, there, we may lose a job. I've known many people who have lost jobs because of uh, having to make a decision on, on some ethical issues and taking a stand where they lost their job. <clears throat> I think just generally we, we don't feel at home in this world, do we? We just don't feel at home. I, I'm sure a lot of you can testify to this with friendships and just other things. So what should our posture be towards this kind of suffering for Jesus? For the pain, the most emotional, whatever pain that it, it causes. Love the truth. Continue to love. Yeah. You know, I found it to be the older that I get, just being a persecuted at the abortion mill, like, mm -hmm. that's not who you are. You're, you're commanded to go and love and speak mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. And like, yeah. I think somebody said, we're just not home. Like, yeah, we're not home. But we do, we continue to love. And we continue to speak the truth and grace and truth, right? Jesus was 100% all. Um, Philippians 1.29, if you want to write these verses down, in Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. So do we embrace it knowing that we are sharing in the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ? Like That is what Paul is saying, that we actually, that we're sharing this with him. Um, Acts 5.41, if you want to write down this verse, rejoicing, they, um, let's see, who was it? Paul and Silas, I believe, they left the presence of the council after being beaten, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Joy. Joy. Um, you know, I think we just are always ready to give an answer of that hope that is in us with gentleness and respect and with love, but we remember that because of his suffering, we can suffer well and we can have boldness and hope because of him. And if you want another passage to look up, I won't read all the verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. So let's ask the Lord to help us be bold witnesses for him and to be willing and prepared. It shouldn't take us by surprise when we do suffer for him, when, when we are called names, <laughs> when we have people distance themselves, and um, even worse, even worse, if that day should come. And keep in mind our, our missionaries and the, our brothers and sisters around the globe who are indeed facing death on a daily basis because of, of their stand for Christ and supporting them in prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, with meekness and respect, with fear and respect, with love and truth, with grace and truth, yes. Something that you just said, um, suffer well, I remember yeah. like six times, yeah. uh, along with um, in James where it says to count it all joy. Yes. For about 10 years, that has been a verse that I feel like is so far away from anything Carrie can even grasp. 
Yeah. I, yeah. My first inclination is always to nurse my wound when I yeah. feel like someone didn't yeah. treat me with the respect, whatever. Yeah. And just that is, that is, I'm supposing that has to be a work of the Spirit. Yeah. That is not it is. It has to be a work from the spirit because our yeah. tendency is to avoid pain, yeah. is to avoid oh, yeah. suffering. Yes, a hundred percent, exactly right. And yeah. it is the spirit who gives us that ability. And I wanted to like piggyback off of that because sometimes, like when we hear the examples of Paul and Silas, I actually feel more discouraged than anything else <laughs> because I'm like, are they even human? You know, like it's just like annoying to hear stories like that, and then to like consider the application of like embracing suffering like that's just like really you know like we don't no one wants it no one welcomes it like so I think that like what I have to remind myself is that is not the natural response like that is absolutely not going to be our natural response Mm -hmm. and that's okay like Mm -hmm. because you are human right and so we're not naturally going to feel happy or encouraged or whatever when we go through these trials but I think what we can remind ourselves is that what happened with Paul and Silas is that when they were faced with that moment, God gave them that grace. Absolutely. And he right. gave them that peace. Mm-hmm. And so, like, we just have to remember, if anyone else is like me, I worry about suffering. I worry about things that could happen. Mm-hmm. And so, instead of worrying, I just have to remind myself, you know what, if that does happen, God forbid, but if that does happen... God's going to give me the grace and peace for that moment that I'm, I'm not experiencing it right now because I'm not experiencing yes. that moment. But that's, he is going to help me. That's absolutely true and, and really good to remember. I think it's like that when we suffer through any pain. I look at things that people suffer that are the worst case possible scenarios and I'm just like, no, Lord, I, I could not do that. But isn't it so true that God gives those people grace and then when they testify of the grace that God has given them, it blesses us. Right? I mean, how many times I've been blessed by ladies in this room by hearing stories of, of different people. And I'm like, thank you, Lord, for those promises because, yeah, right now, I, I, you're right, I, I, I'm not feeling it. No, for sure. Can I just think of the verse that it, our, um, the trials, like you already said, it tests the genuineness. Like yeah. If we never had a trial, how would yeah. we know that our faith has a solid foundation? Yes, absolutely. We would not choose paths of suffering and pain for ourselves if it were up to us. We're going to talk about that coming up right now. So, good. I love these comments. Um, I was looking at um, 1 Peter 5 and 12. We'll talk about suffering. But more in the context, not of like persecution, um, but like death to self and resisting sin is a form of suffering. Mm -hmm. It's one that we choose. Right. It is. And that is for the sake of Christ. Yes. I am going to choose to resist Satan, and that's the context in which Peter writes, resist him, yeah. firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by brotherhood throughout the world. Good point, yeah. And so, like, yeah. We're, we're not all facing, like, actual persecution, um, but we are all facing an enemy who is probably, yeah. we have to resist all right. And Say like it, right. death to self, right? So like yes. Death to self is suffering. Ab- absolutely. It's one that we gladly choose because right. this is worth it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, trials may come here and there, but that's right. That's a good. Good. So good. Good. Well, Moving on, in, in chapter 2, I mentioned that we're going to be using the book Suffering by Paul David Tripp, and, and the subtitle is Gospel, Hope, and Life Doesn't Make Sense. But in chapter 2, he makes the statement that suffering is never neutral and is always working something in us, as, as we've been talking about. And he says, we don't just suffer the things we are suffering, we suffer the way we are suffering that thing. And that may sound confusing, but... Um, Let me explain what that means. (laughs) I guess we could say it this way. We all bring a lot of stuff and a lot of baggage into our suffering other than the actual thing we're suffering. So for instance, if you come from a poor background and you or your spouse lose your job, you are bringing a past experience that is going to magnify the fear and the angst that you feel over losing that job. If you are trying to have children, 
and, and God has not blessed you, and all of your friends are having children, you are bringing something else to that suffering that you are already experiencing because you have now the comparisons and feeling singled out and, and isolated in your suffering. So that is what it's saying. Our past experiences make up context for what we're suffering. Um, what are some other weights? Maybe our assumptions, our expectations, our perspectives, our desires, our emotions, our view of God, and our view of others. A whole lot of things will affect the way we suffer. Sometimes we may not even realize all of those other things that are actually really compounding our suffering until the layers start getting peeled away. Um, so Tripp says that your suffering is more powerfully shaped by what's in your heart than by what's in your body or in the world around you or what it is we're suffering. In other words, um, the cancer or disease that is in my body has less to do with my suffering than what's in my heart. And that, you mean like, ah, uh, well, what is in our heart, we can say this, that we can agree on this, is most clearly seen when we suffer. Um, I like this example. So say I was holding a cup of coffee, super full, overflowing, and Nita comes here and jostles my arm, and I spill it. Okay, so you might say, um, why did you spill coffee all over the place? And I would say, well, because Anita jostled my arm. Or you could say, because coffee was what was in my cup. <laughs> if I had tea in my cup, I would have spilled tea all over the place. If I had juice in my cup, I would have spilled juice all over the place. Um, do you get what the point is? What is in our heart when the trials come is going to be what spills out. And so that is why we say, yes, it is going to show what is in our heart. And that's why God puts these things into our life, because it's going to show what is in our cup when, things, when we get jostled around a little bit. Proverbs 4.23, hopefully you kind of know this verse, keep your heart with all diligence because out of it spring all of the issues of life. Your heart is the center of who you are. It's your truest thoughts, not what you want people to think you are. It's what, who you truly are, your view of God, your attitudes, your desires. Um, and it's what's in our heart that Tripp says can cause us to trouble our own trouble or to add dimensions to our suffering. Um, so, all right, let's see. He offers seven things to consider that we may be bringing into our suffering. We're going to try to get through these today. Here they are. Poor theology. Doubt of God. Unrealistic expectations of life. Unrealistic expectations of others. Pride. Materialism. And selfism. So please hang on tight, because here we go. We're going to try to try to get through these as we can. Um, by theology, we were talking about basically the worldview that we have. <laughs> Maybe you don't think about it very often, but you have a theology that you live by. You have a worldview, and it affects um, how you view your world, your circumstances, God, those who you live with. It causes you to ask how you answer the questions like, what, who is God? What is he doing? Why is he doing what he is doing? Why am I even here? What, why do I think this is right and this is wrong? Where is hope and purpose and motivation to be found? Why should I get out of bed tomorrow morning? Why should I like you or be nice to you? All of these things shape our theology, shapes all of these sorts of questions and tons more. But since our thoughts always precede our actions, what we think about these things and what we think about God and our theology affects the way we suffer 100%. Bad theology can pop up all over the place in our suffering. He, uh, Tripp gives two specific examples, and I thought that maybe I would share these because I, for one, could definitely relate to them. Um, and the first one is, God is punishing me for my sin. And I know we just talked about that there are consequences for sin and that, yes, we need to take sin seriously, absolutely. Um, because, you know, yeah, you, you speed, you get a speeding ticket. You abuse your body, you get sick. There are consequences of sin. But this is a theology that, that is warped. It takes it to another level. Like, like I have 
I have cancer or my child is suffering because God is upset with me and punishing me for my past sins. Or um, my washing machine broke down because I had a fight with my husband. Or I fell down the stairs because I said a bad word. Or if I don't have my devotions today, something bad is going to happen to me. All right, this is, now, does anyone ever have thoughts like this invade your brain? No? None of you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Even maybe more subtle than that? <laughs> Please, I do. But... Trip, he says, how discouraging not only to go through hard and maybe even life-altering circumstances, but also to think you are going through those because you've fallen short of God's standard. It's hard to run to God for help, to rest in his care, to be assured of his love, and to believe that his mercies are constantly available and new every day when you're convinced that you're being punished by him. And it's hard to reach out for God's grace when you think he's giving you what you deserve. I liked that quote. I was like, yeah, Sarah. Disciplining by a loving father involves training. It involves like I'm, I'm, I'm leading you gently through this. And yes, I'm, this is going to be hard, but this is a part of what you need as my child. And you know, I, there's just a very big difference between him purifying and sanctifying us and working good in us and being mad at us and punishing us. And Romans eight one through four, I think you know these verses reminds us that there is no condemnation. Um, we do not stand condemned before him when we are in Christ Jesus. When we have repented of our sins, we are justified before him. Amen. And we are loved by a holy God. And he, because of the death of Jesus and his resurrection, he sees, uh, he sees us as righteous <coughs> as his son. Um, and so scripture shows us that passages like James 1 and 2 through 4, that some people mention that trials and difficulties are being used by a loving and good God to produce good in his children. And Johnny Erickson even said once, sometimes God will allow the things that he hates to work the things that he loves in his children. And that was like, wow, for somebody like her to say that, that, that means a lot because she's been through a lot. And that, I, I love that. So, yeah, and that's one area of, of theology that can be just a mess. And then number two, my idea of good <laughs> means a happy ending to the circumstances promised in Romans 8.28. That he will work all things together for good. My good. My idea of good. My idea of good means relief. It means healing from my pain. It means deliverance. It means restoration of this relationship. It means a timely answer to my prayer, Lord. And so when we have these expectations of what good is, we think that God could not be good because he's not working this to good, to my good. And that is bad theology. Read on in verses 29 and 30 of Romans 8, 28, 29 and 30. And our good is listed as our redemption, our sanctification, fulfilling the purpose that he has for our lives. Those are the good things that he has for us, right? So it may not look good, but that is the ultimate good he is working or in our lives. So those are just two quick ones. Um, doubt, on God, doubt of God is one that we're going to have a whole section on as one of the pitfalls on suffering. But um, Tripp says, suffering will always expose the true nature of your relationship to and your communion of God. If a health crisis or something, it shakes you to your core, but if you, if you bring doubt of God into that suffering, then your suffering has just been elevated to a different level. And... Um, so if, um, I'm just going to skip a little, when things start getting taken away that we've been relying on more than him, our true theology is revealed. Is he enough? Is he loving? Is he good? And is he powerful? And how good to come out on the other side 
when God brings us through the trial and he does reveal himself to us and, and he does confirm that he is all of those things and he will do that. But yes, doubt of God is one that maybe you're struggling with. And if you are, share it with a friend. Share it with a loved one so they can help you get through this crisis of faith because it happens to a lot of us when our faith is in crisis. It, it does. Um, we, need, we need the Spirit. We need friends praying for us. Um, it, it's a real thing. Unrealistic expectations of life. God has really been laying this on me this week. Um, that we bring this idea into our lives that, I don't know, that number one, two ways we can have false expectations. What is true today will be true tomorrow and the days after that, forgetting that we live in a world where change is a constant reality, that Romans 8.21 tells us that we live in a world that is a bondage, in bondage to corruption. The curse of sin is ever with us, decay, is an ever-present reality. That means nothing remains the same. Our bodies are going to grow old. Our friendships can sour. Our marriages can grow distant. Our churches can fall into difficulty. Um, somehow, in some way, all good things around us are under constant attack. And do we live with that expectation, or do we just get lulled into thinking that all is going to stay the same, and we, will, we, I, will somehow avoid the suffering of living in a broken world? Because you know what? Our world is broken. And if I have that expectation, then I am going to be blindsided when some of these things enter my life. And a number two, along these same lines, Romans 8.22, we talked about this a little last week. We live in a groaning world. Do we take seriously the broken state of the world and the results of sin <coughs> in our world? The groaning is real. I mean, groaning is what we do when we're in pain, when we're discouraged, when we're frustrated, when we're hurting. But even creation is groaning under the strain of sin and the curse. Um, Tripp again says, if you don't take seriously the groaning condition of our world, you will live with the naive expectation of what your life will be. You will be unprepared for the trouble that comes your way, and you will be susceptible to the myriad of temptations that come your way. It's like, ouch. Yep. That has been me sometimes. Yeah. Mhm. And Satan's going to hit us in those spots. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I I feel like in America, in our postmodern world here too, being used to having our creature comforts met and just being used to the ease of which things come, quick results and all that. Maybe we fall prey to this even more than other people. I, I speak for myself. I don't know about you. But um, I, I just the, the advice is that I need to keep my well full of God's promises in the good times so that when the trials do come, we have something to draw from. And be ready for it because it will happen. It's not a matter of if or when it's a matter of will. And it's like being prepared for a military drill, like military drills for when the day actually comes. Um, because that day is coming, it will come. And so we are just, we're prepared. We've got our defense and the, the spirit, you know, we're, so, and the beautiful hope through this, and we mentioned this last word, that this broken and groaning world <laughs> is someday going to be restored to its original state of perfection and he will hold us fast until that time and continue to do his work in us till we're glorified and brought into our eternal home. And that is just so, so comforting. Um, unrealistic expectation of others, just briefly, everyone in the world, everyone around us, everyone in our lives is a broken sinner like we are, and it never works to turn a person into your personal Messiah. It never works, this is Paul Tripp, a quote, it never works to look to another for your identity. It never works to ask people to give you meaning and purpose. It is unrealistic to look for someone for inner peace. It never goes well when you ask another flawed human being to be the source of your happiness. There is an ever faithful Messiah and no one around you is capable of taking his place and doing for you what he alone can do. And that's not our husbands, friends, if you're married, not our husbands. It's not our friends if you're not married and have best buds not our friends, it's not our children, not our pastors, it's 
not our parents, it's no one. Um, so when we elevate people too high and we're, so it, it just, it can, our suffering can become more intensified when they fail us. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 5, thus says, says the Lord, says the Lord, cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. And in verse 7 and 8, he says, blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. Yes. The, those were found in Jeremiah 17, verses 5, and verses 7 and 8. So a sure way to add to our suffering is to put our trust in someone other than God to do what he alone can do. Pride exposes the dangers of self-reliance in our lives. Sometimes we don't even realize how much we've been trusting in ourself, our own strength, our own health, our sharp minds. Our ability to get along with people, I can charm anyone, our, you know, our leadership ability, and we fail to remember that not one tiny bit of that is anything that we have done. It's all been given to us. And when we suffer the loss of any of those things, our health, our sharp minds, our relationships with people, anything, um, it can really rock, rock our world because suddenly we have no control. We have the lack of being able to understand what's happening, we panic, and it just it compounds our suffering. And so I feel like God sometimes allows us the loss of different things to expose where we have been really dependent on ourself and in our pride. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11, Paul said, when I am weak, then am I made strong in your strength because guess what? Like, none of it is me. I can't, I can't do this. And so pride is, is one of those areas, too, of those um, used, not being. Um, taking me overseas to be a missionary to, because I, I love people and I'm talkative and I, yeah. I get my joys from that. Yeah. And then my husband already had Russian, but we landed in Russia and I was taking classes. Mm hmm Yeah. I, I mm. remember once thinking, oh, we had a small a Bible study group in our house, and it was like, I think I know what they're talking about. But by the time I formed a sentence, there were two topics down the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it just, to be strict is good. Yeah. It's hurt. It hurts, though. You know, and I find that this is maybe one of the ones that God, like, why are you upset? Why are you hurting right now? Why? And And when I start really like, thinking about it, it's coming back to some kind of pride, like, oh, that hurt me because there was some pride or something going on in my heart, and or something got took, taken away, and that was, Lord, that was what I was good at, and, and that took, they took that away from me. Well, you know, it's, it's pride, and so, um, yeah, it, it's hard, and it hurts, you're right. Materialism is the other one that, you know, if we love our material things, our material blessings, our houses, our jobs, our financial security, our, our good looks, whatever it might be, and those things are taken away. Suddenly we lose our job. Suddenly we lose our health. Suddenly those things are taken away. Those material things, physical things, um, we feel like we lost our identity because I lost my job. I mean, that was me. That was my home. It burnt you know, to the ground. I lost all my stuff. That's my whole life went into that house. I mean, these things can are very transient, and they are never meant to do what God can. And so the Lord can cause things to our heart to point out that there's some of this wrong thinking in, in our hearts. Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Well, that's definitely, yeah, depending on others to make us happy. That was a tough one for me. <laughs> one of the hardest. Well, I think yeah. for me, God, is, what God has been doing throughout the process is <clears throat> I have leaned on my family a lot. And I think little by little, he's been taking all my crutches away so I can learn to depend on him. Mm. And um, part of that is discovering who I am now. And I think that's really a blessing, not really something I'm suffering 
Yeah, indirectly yeah, a blessing. So I, I'm getting to find out who I am as a 51 year old single woman and mm -hmm. what I'm going to be able to do. Right. And um, yesterday I had that opportunity to do that, and who knows what else I'll discover that I'm yeah. talented in and I can do. That pruning that we talked about yeah. sometimes is, is hurt, it hurts, but it's for the sake for us to be more fruitful and, yeah. The selfism, and this is, um, what was your name one more time? Trisha. Trisha, she was talking about this, that the selfishness, um, 2 Corinthians 5.15 says that he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Um, sin and selfishness may, causes us to want our, our wants, our needs, our concerns, our feelings, at the center of our universe. <laughs> it can be subtle, but we can have the sense of entitlement that inwardly we would never say it or a secret, but it really expects and demands things to happen our way because after all, our way is best. And Tripp says, suffering confronts us with the fact that life is not about us, but about God. It is not about our glory, but his. It's not about our plans for us, but about his will for us. It's not about our control, but his. It's not about our little kingdom, but about his. It's not about our successes, but about the display of his majesty. And I, I love that. Because like we were saying, and Sarah was saying, if we were in control, we would make sure we never suffered. Um, and often the crisis of our faith that happens when we suffer is a result of a collision between our will and God's will, <laughs> our good and his glory. In our selfishness, we can't see our suffering as any kind of good, so we begin to question whether God who has allowed it into our lives is good. So putting yourself in the center will always make the trouble you face more troublesome. Um, so... There were some other things I was hoping to cover, um, but we are already over time, and we did get through the primary things. So thank you.